So, you know, I've talked, uh, we've talked a lot about um, kind of the, the, the kind of nutty left, the woke left, um, uh, anti-racism, in quotes, anti-racism or racist agenda. Uh, we've talked a lot about how uh, it seems like in the political realm, uh, a lot of the wacky left's agenda is being successfully rebuffed by voters, whether that was, as we saw, that was in Northern Virginia, uh, sorry, in, um, yeah, in Virginia, including Northern Virginia, um, uh, last uh, in, in November in the vote there for governor, and, and, uh, and then we saw it in San Francisco, we've seen it in Minneapolis, we've seen it defund the police, we've seen it uh, CRT in the schools. We're seeing generally a voter backlash uh, including in pretty left-wing uh, cities around the country against kind of the, the wacky left. I, I'd also say that, um, you know, while a lot of businesses give uh, the agenda of, uh, uh, of the left a lot of credence and they, they bring in DEI and they do courses and they do all of this stuff, my general sense of business is that it is... Um, it says what it needs to say to keep on going, but none of this is taken too seriously. Generally, I think even young people who kind of believe in the left's uh, nonsensical ideas, once they actually have to live in the world, they have to make a living, they, they, they have to go to a job, they actually have a reality, uh, and there's a reality check, they have to de actually have to have goals, they have to achieve those goals. If they don't achieve those goals, they can lose their job. I mean, there's actually a, an impact of reality on their lives. Uh, so I'd say the, the impact of, of kind of the, the left's uh, more wacky agenda is, is mitigated by young people when they go into, into the real life work environment they, you know, they get slapped around, they get woken up, they get, they get a dose of reality, which moves them away from the craziest of the ideas. So I think in business, uh, generally, this happens to young people. I think it certainly happens uh, politically. It's happening to, to the radical left. Their ideas are, uh, are being rejected. It, it, again, it, it, whenever the ideas clash with reality, with, with people's desires to, to, to live a better life, to, to live, you know, just the basics, not to have crime in the streets and have the kids get a decent education and, and uh, you know, not have a complete um, a horror in the streets around them and, and some cleanliness and not have being attacked by homeless people and, and they have a, ba you know, basic police force and, and the kids actually study history. People reject the ideas of the left. And so I think in much of the world in which we live, these ideas are being chipped away at, uh, they're being challenged, they're being rejected, they're being questioned. Um, and there is a mechanism by which, in a sense, a self-correcting mechanism as things move further, further, further to the left, they kind of get slapped around and, and beaten back. Uh, I've said this many times, Americans are not nihilists. Most Americans don't advocate for nihilism, don't want at nihilism, don't support nihilism, indeed reject nihilism. And as a consequence, um, you know, as a consequence, these ideas don't really, uh, you know, plant themselves in the culture and sustain themselves over time. Not in many, much of our activities uh, that we engage in, except in one area, but it turns out to be a very, 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 very important area, but except for one area, and that is academia, that is the university, and ultimately our entire educational program, but particularly the educational programs that are now beyond the reach of parents who care about their kids. Wes, wow, Wes just uh, contributed $100. Uh, that's fantastic, really appreciate that. So, you know, when it comes to K through 12, there's some, Self-correcting mechanism, parents. But what is the self-correcting mechanism in academia? And I would argue that there really is none. Uh, it could be uh, students uh, not going to certain universities because they've gone so wacky left, but students are not self-aware enough, students are young. Again, there's no self-correcting of the parents coming in 
and dictating students often go to schools not based on what their parents want, based on what they want. They go study what they want, and, and uh, parents are, be, um, are much more flexible than they are in lower grades. And the only other mechanism to rein in our universities are uh, alumni, and, and we'll talk about that later. So we'll talk about uh, why, uh, you know, that is in a sense our only hope is uh, to, to, to control the nuttiness uh, on our universities is through alumni. So let's go through what it is about universities that makes it so difficult to self-correct and what is the problem right now in universities. And, and uh, let me start by just acknowledging, look, the, 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 we all know that the universities are, are left way left of center, have been way left of center for years and years and years. Uh, you could argue for decades. They certainly were left of center uh, when I was uh, getting my PhD. Uh, that's many decades ago. And, um, uh, you know, we really, the left has been taking over the universities, and this is not, no secret. Everybody knows this. The left has been taking over the universities slowly but systematically, uh, not as a conscious plan, but just as, a, as the way it, it, it happens, right? Um, the YBS support page is down. Huh. Interesting. Uh, Iran Brookshow.com. Let's see. That's up. Let's click support. Uh, I don't see the support page. Where's the support page? Maybe it is down. All right. I'll have to yeah, sponsor pages down. Um, all right, I'll uh, talk to my IT people and find out. Could be that they're working on it and they're, they're doing things. Glenn, thank you uh, for the $50. Emmanuel, thank you for letting me know that the support page is not working and for the $20, I really appreciate that. All right, so um, we all know universities have been left. They've been left forever. Uh, they've been more and more and more left over time. Uh, simply based on a, on a pretty straightforward, simple mechanism. And that mechanism is tenure. So uh, the, way university, uh, the way universities uh, work is, um, the way universities work is, you, you, uh, you get a PhD. Um, so let's assume you've already been accepted into grad school, you, you, you apply for grad school, you get accepted into grad school, you get a PhD, and now you go in the job market. Uh, historically, you go in the job market, uh, they, they base the decision on how good you are, or what you published, the dissertation, you go, typically you go to different universities that want to interview you, you present your work, they evaluate that work, and then based on all of that, based on the quality of your work, they will uh, tend to offer you uh, a, a position. Then you, uh, they offer you a position as what's called an assistant professor. You go in and you work as an assistant professor. And uh, after seven years, six, seven years, uh, and it, it somewhat varies, I guess, depending on department and depending on university, you go up for tenure. That is, after six or seven years, the university decides, do they want to keep you or don't they want to keep you? And um, so they look at, at, at all your research, and then they look at all your teaching and your teaching evaluations, and they look at what they call a service. You know, the committees you've served at the universities, all the stuff you've done in terms of the universities, in terms of the university uh, and faculty commitments. And then they basically make a decision about whether to offer you tenure or not. And, and if you're offered tenure, uh, and you accept, then you basically got a job for life. Very difficult, very, very, very difficult to fire a professor who has tenure. Um, you can show up when you want, you can do the work, you cannot do the work, as long as you basically teach uh, your load, maybe do a little bit of service, although even that you can get away with not doing anything, not doing being on any committees. Uh, but as long as you do your teaching, as long as you don't uh, assault anybody, um, it's very hard to lose your job um, as a tenured professor. Very, very, very difficult. So you got a job for life. Now, if you want to make full professor, that's the, the highest um, uh, standard. So as a tenured professor, you're an associate professor. To make full professor, you have to, um, you have to again, publish and everything, and you go up, and, 
and there's a committee, and they decide whether to give you a full professorship or not. Now, if you do not get tenure, you're out. You, you've got a year to leave the university. And during that late year, you can look for another university job, but you didn't get tenure. It's a little tainted already. Uh, you might become an adjunct. Uh, you might get another university job, but probably not a tenure job. Uh, you're basically out of influence in terms of academia. So for every uh, uh, you know, student what's, uh, that wants to be a university professor, the key is uh, you know, get, do your PhD, which usually takes about six years, five, six years. Get a PhD. Don't piss people off too much. Uh, get good recommendations from the people you got the PhD from. Uh, write a dissertation that's acceptable to schools. Get job offers, get a job, then spend six years writing papers, getting published, again, getting published, peer-reviewed, your peers are reviewing you, and then a committee decides whether they want you as a faculty member forever at the university or not. Once you're in, you can pretty much do what you want, say what you want, you know, there are consequences to that as well, but basically they can't fire you and you got a job for life. That's the way it works. Now, think about it. If you're already a tenure professor at a university, who do you want to hire? Who do you want to surround yourself? Remember, when you choose somebody for tenure, you're choosing, uh, you're choosing somebody uh, that is going to be your colleague for many, many, many years. You're going to see him around the corridors, around the school, uh, in, in, in you know, uh, department meetings for decades. Who are you going to choose to hang around? Well, you're going to choose people you, you like, people you tend to agree with people who are not going to shake things up too much, people who, uh, you know, are not going to be your ideological or personal enemies. So the tenure decision and the original hiring decision are very much about the kind of people you want to surround yourself with and the kind of people who are going, who do the kind of work that kind of fits in with your work. So it's, a, it's kind of a self-reinforcing. So once, let's say, the, for example, the left gets a foothold in a particular department, um, you know, they're likely to want to hire people like them. And they hire people like them, and then they're more of, of, of you know, a particular point of view in the department. And they might want some diversity among point of views if they're a little bit intellectually curious. But generally, within a particular context, a particular framework, we don't want anything a little too much to upset things. And then the people who you hire that are cutting edge tend to be cutting edge in your direction. So if you're on the spectrum of, I don't know, kind of center left all the way to wacky left being 10 and center left being one, uh, you know, if you're one, maybe you hire a three. But then once you've got a few threes in the department, they tend to hire fives. And once you get a bunch of fives in the department, they tend to hire sevens. And you can see that over time, these departments tend to drift leftwards. To a large extent, because the graduate students are, uh, come from a particular ideological, philosophical, political background. Most PhD students uh, are you know, tend to be from and of the left, that form of collectivism. There's some on the right, and, and what you see is they concentrate in certain departments in certain places, even in certain fields. Some areas have fewer people of the right, uh, and some places have more of them. And, and how you define right and left, as we've talked so many times, is ambiguous. So what you see is this trend of departments moving more and more and more to the left. Uh, in a sense, PhD students knowing this, so they either don't go into grad school and get a PhD if they're not going to fit, and if they do go in, they want to push the envelope a little bit, they're going to push it further out left, whether that's further out towards socialism, further out towards uh, what's now called critical, critical, critical theory, critical race theory, critical literature theory, uh, whether it's further out towards postmodernism, whatever it happens to be in that department, they're pushing out. And I think this is how, over time, by people 
voting in the people they like by the, or, or the people that support their point of view. This is also what happens in journals. Uh, you, you know, your best chance of getting published in a, book, in a journal is taking an existing theory, taking a theory that people basically represents the consensus, and basically reinforcing it a little bit or pushing it in the boundaries a little bit, but not challenging it too much. Challenging might not get published. The top journals tend to publish things that incrementally move the field within a particular context that is already acceptable. So you get in academia a constant reinforcement of the prevailing ideas, constantly being pushed further and further to the left because the left is what dominates our, uh, our universities. Right? So even though, for example, in economics, uh, the way, uh, the, 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 let's say in economics, the, the more pro-markets, uh, there's been an increase in, in their numbers in certain places. Uh, and there was a period in which it really had a sense that free market economics was taking over. It was everywhere. It, was, it, was, it, it had the chance to really, really dominate. It, it, it never really happened. Partially because economic departments didn't let it happen. Um, and what, what has landed up happening, for example, in economics is that the good guys, the better guys, the, the free market people, have tended to concentrate in particular schools, in particular places. Yes, Harvard might have one or two, and, and all the top schools have one or two, but those departments are dominated by different forms of statist economists who then hire statist economists, and they might have one or two free market guys in order to have some intellectual diversity, but not too much as to reshape the character of that department, to reshape the type of people they're interacting with. Now, what's happening right now at universities is that they have become dominated by, uh, you know, by DEI, by... Um, just fight. one second. Yeah, there it is. Uh, by DEI, diversity, diversity, um, right? In, uh, something in inclusion. What's what's the E stand for? I had it a second ago. <laughs> um, thank you. E equity. So diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and that, that is the new politically correct thing that has to be uh, emphasized. And what, is, what does it mean? It's really kind of the old standard of uh, making sure your department is diverse, making sure you have uh, minorities uh, represented, and so on. But it's, it's taken a, a nasty twist, right? It's not just representation. It's now much more than just representation. So when I was interviewing for a job, uh, when I got my PhD in, in finance, and was interviewing for a job at a university, the, the, the chairman of the department basically told me, uh, look, Yaron, we really like you, and we want to hire you, and I think we're going to hire you, but we can't yet make you an offer. Because there is a, a, a black woman who is on the market uh, at the same time as you. And look, we have to offer her a job because that way we can tell the university uh, you know, authorities, the, the people, you know, the administrators, we can tell them, you know, we offered the job to a woman, we offered the job to somebody who's black, and they can tick that box. She turned us down. So what could we do? We had to hire this, you know, uh, uh, Jew with white skin, right? Um, which, which, the th which the authorities did not like because uh, for a variety of reasons. And this is a true story. Uh, and uh, they said, but don't worry. We're going to offer her the job. But don't worry because everybody's going to offer her the job. All the universities are going to offer her the job. And it's almost... It's very unlikely, very unlikely, that she accepts our offer, given that some much more prestigious universities 
are going to offer her the job. Why are they going to offer the job? Because she's basically the only black female on the market this year. So she's going to get an, an amazing job at an amazing salary somewhere. So don't worry, we'll offer you the job next once she says no. And indeed, uh, you know, uh, a lot happened. There was a lot of drama around my hiring for a variety of reasons, primarily um, a variety of reasons. Um, and ultimately, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, and, and uh, part of that had to do with actually me, me being Jewish and there being too many Jews in the department. But nobody officially said that, but that was implicit. Uh, but ultimately, I got the job because she turned them down. So this stuff has always been ha has been going on for a long time, for decades now. This idea of diversity, and we need women, and we need we need minorities in the department, and s that skewed kind of the hiring to some extent and created uh, real injustices. Imagine if I'd not gotten that job. Uh, this is the job I really wanted because not because they like somebody more than me, not because somebody else was better, more qualified than me, not because uh, they had a better dissertation than me, they presented better than me, they taught better than me, or anything like that. No, they would have gotten the job because of the color of their skin. So that's been going on for a long time. A long time. But DEI is different. DEI is different. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to read you from... Um, a post on John Cochran's uh, Grumpy Economist um, <coughs> blog, which I highly recommend, always have. One of my favorite economists by far. Well, how can he be one of them by far? But he's certainly one of my favorite economists. He is quoting, so I'll be quoting from him quoting an article uh, that was published. Uh, where was it published? <coughs> Oops, not that one. Uh, it was published in the New Discourse by um, Stephen Brint, Brint <coughs> oh, excuse me, and Kobe uh, German. Let me drink some water. Um, I'll also be quoting, uh, or we're telling you the story, or quoting from this article by uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph H. Manson, who's got, I guess, a, uh, a blog as well, or a Substack. Um, where he's, he's talking about why he's leaving the university, which was published, I think, a couple of days ago, why, why he's a tenured faculty and he's leaving. He didn't have to leave. They, they can't fire him, but he's leaving anyway. Let's see. Um, I, I mean, I like, uh, I like John Cochran. So Cochran says, you know, I hate to use the Wellian, or Wellian term DEI, and he's right because DEI is not about uh, certainly not about equity, not if you understand what equity is and, and, and not about inclusion or diversity. Ultimately, it's about politics. He says, um, I hate to use the term DEI. It is really CPE. So DEI is really CPE. What does CPE stand for, according to uh, John Cochran? Conformity, preference, and exclusion. I like that. Conformity, preference, and exclusion. Okay, so here's the quote. This is what DEI now is all about. It's, right, and I'm quoting. By 2019, eight of the 10, and this is all from the University of California, universe, 10, uh, eight of the 10 University of California campuses mandated that ladder rank faculty recruitment require candidates to submit diversity statements. Notice this is not about whether you are, represent diversity, whether you are minority or whatever, but your attitude towards diversity. That is, you have to submit a diversity statement. The, the, and I'm quoting again. These statements ask candidates to discuss what they have contributed to the university's goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what they're asking you is not I don't know, how do you add to the racial or sexual diversity in a department, in a campus, which is kind of a question they could never ask in the past, but kind of what they were all thinking in the past. The question now is, what have you done <coughs> to contribute 
to the university's goals of diversity, equity, inclusion. What are your views on DEI? And what have you actually practiced? I mean, have you gone to a Black Lives Matter demonstration? Have you smashed some windows? Have you signed some petitions? Have you done something? In other words, have you been an activist? What is your opinion, in a sense, about DEI? So they, uh, this is again from uh, University of California, and this is from the article quoting, um, they delineate criteria for scores ranging from one poor to five excellent. An applicant who doesn't discuss gender or race ethnicity should receive a poor score, as should an applicant who sees DEI as anti-ethical to academic freedom or university's research mission. So if you have a particular political view, philosophical view, the DEI is not consistent with the university's mission, that it's not consistent with academic freedom, you don't have academic freedom. You basically get a poor score. It says, an applicant who discusses DEI as core values that every faculty member should actively contribute to advancing should receive an excellent score. So basically, if you agree with their political agenda, if you agree with their philosophical agenda, then you get an excellent score. And if you get, if you don't, you get a poor score. Now, okay, so they rank my views of DEI. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because this screen is done on all job applicants for academic jobs at the university. And only the people who get acceptable scores, their resumes, their hiring package is then passed on to the departments to review. So note that anybody who's not does not have a positive view of DEI, who's not an activist with regard to DEI or, or pretends to be an activist or argues for activism with regard to DEI, doesn't even get the hiring package at the department level to be reviewed at the departmental level for hiring. The screened out, screened out. Now, in a, in a, 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 a kind of a, a talk that one um, sociologist gave, um, actually, this is an article she wrote on the pages of Inside Higher Education, trying to explain to people how to write their, um, their statement, right, their DEI statement, their diversity statement. She says, don't worry about too, being too political. Because if you write something not too political, it might come across as blasé and people, and you'll get a poor score. Indeed, you should demonstrate that you have, quote, awareness of how systematic inequalities affect students' ability to excel, unquote. And you should show your commitment to activism. And you should tell your story, you know, of the obstacles you faced or or if you haven't faced obstacles, as many of us obviously have not faced obstacles, you need to acknowledge your privilege. She recommended that applicants focus on, quote, racial oppression, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, or some other commonly recognized form of oppression. And when it comes to teaching, she encouraged applicants to express their commitment to anti-racist pedagogy. So basically, what they're saying is, if you want a job at our university, at one of these eight of 10 UC campuses, University of California campuses, and this, by the way, supposedly, now I haven't fact-checked all this. This could be an exaggeration. This could be over the top. I kind of am relying on John Cochran fact-checking it. Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. Hopefully he has. But I think this applies across the university. So this would apply to STEM. This would apply to, to any position, to business schools, to any position being hired. As you're coming out of grad school, you have to provide a statement, a diversity statement. So. 
So here's what happens. I, I, I already described this, but this is in their terms. In 2018, the university began to experiment with the use of diversity statement as the initial screening device in faculty searches. And I'm quoting from the article. In a presentation prepared by UC Davis Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, search committee members were instructed to review a candidate's contribution to a diversity statement before any other part of the application, and candidates who do not look outstanding with regard to their contributions to diversity would not advance for further consideration in the hiring process. In other words, only people with the right politics get to move forward. Only people with the right politics get to be considered for a job. Right. UC Berkeley has published information about the effects of the policy mandating the use of diversity statement as an initial screening device. In one faculty search, less than one quarter of otherwise qualified candidates had submitted diversity statements that were sufficient for advancement to the next stage of hiring. So 75% were not deemed acceptable from a political perspective, from a political standard, political ideological standard. This is a binding constraint. Now this will turn almost immediately. These departments overwhelmingly you know, uh, uh, it, it, wacky left all the way out there, politically. That's who they're going to hire, because that's the only people they have to hire from. The system will not allow them to hire anybody else. <sighs> during, um, during job talks, you know, uh, where you go uh, to the university as a grad, when you're finishing grad school, and you present kind of the work that you're doing, your dissertation. During job talks, candidates were asked to explain their ideas about diversity, and their responses determined whether they were eligible to be hired in the late stages. Candidates were limited because they were perceived as being insufficiently committed to DEI, regardless of their academic qualifications. And it, it, this goes on and on, and it's, it, it, it truly is scary. And what, what, what happens is that, you know, uh, um, you, you start building up a faculty that is more and more and more, you know, aligned with the craziest, most left-wing ideas possible. And, and this is what uh, this guy, uh, Joseph H. Manson, describes. He says he's been a tenure, tenure track professor since 1996, uh, well, tenured since 2000 in anthropology department at UCLA. Um, and, you know, for, for a long time, he says this anthropology department, and he considers this anthropology department was very collegial. There was a variety of different points of view. Generally, people tended to be kind of left of center, as most academics were. Um, but he says, gradually, one hire at a time, practitioners of critical, i.e., le uh, far left postmodernist anthropology, some of them lying about their beliefs during job interviews to not seem as wacky as they really were, came to uh, comprise the department's most influential clique. They slowly grew. Also, remember, they are true believers. Like, if you're, like, center-left, eh, well, why can't we all get along? But the, 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 the postmodern left, they're true believers. They believe everybody else is not only wrong, but, but harmful. So they stick together, and they're passionate, and they'll fight. He said, uh, he says there's so many, so many of these, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're particularly nasty. They are uh, super intimidating. Um, and, and he gives an example of how they've treated a particular colleague of his. Uh, his, his name is Jeffrey uh, Brattingham. And uh, Jeff uh, developed a simulation model of the geographic and temporal patterns of urban crime. 
He created a predictive software that he, that he marketed to law enforcement agencies. Now you can imagine what the far left thinks of somebody who has a software program that predicts based on area, based on demographics, based on you know, geographic and, and over time uh, where crimes are going to be committed. You can imagine uh, that they think that this guy is a, a racist, nasty, horrible person. Plus, he's working with the police, the enemy. So they started going after him, and they harassed him, and 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 uh, you know accused him of racism and everything else. And and you know Manson here says, look, Jeff is not a racist; he's a standard issue liberal Democrat. Didn't matter. They restricted his teaching, his ability to teach courses. Uh, they reclassified him. They harassed him. You know, so he basically, basically, Jeff, this faculty member, stopped attending faculty meetings because he was always put down. He basically went silent, didn't interact with anybody, did his teaching. They can't fire him. He didn't fight them. Nobody stood up for him, and he just, in a sense, disappeared. I mean, they literally tried to, you know, organize demonstrations against him, get the administration to fire him. I mean, the guy's not being fired. He's got tenure. It's very hard to fire tenured faculty. But he's also, work conditions are horrific. Um, now... He says, not only was Jeff ostracized, he was unpersoned. I don't know if that's a word, but unpersoned. None of the faculty talked about him as if, uh, you know, whenever they could avoid it. Uh, the department chair, for example, would open every faculty meeting by solemnly intoning that our department was a community, a family, and we're here for each other, except when we don't like you, and then we're not there for you. Um, other colleagues who are not part of the far left were always kind of embarrassed by this, and they kind of supported Jeff, but they didn't want to talk about it, and they didn't want to... They were basically completely in denial, and they realized this was all bullshit, but nobody wants to fight. What are they going to fight for? The left has the moral high ground here. And Jeff himself, in the story, refused to defend himself. He just went silent, just turned his back. He'll retire one day, and he'll be replaced by more of these far left, and they'll hire more of them, and more of them, and they're committed, they're devoted. And this is, of course, all over, uh, he says, all over UCLA. He says, not only do you have uh, this DEI, but the other part of kind of the, the wacky left is a real hatred of Israel, anti-Zionism, which is, as he describes it here, a thinly disguised hatred of Jews. Um, basically, people are advocating kind of the worst anti-Israel, anti-rhetoric. Uh, uh, and this is supported by grad school students, it's supported by faculty, supported by academic departments taking political positions. Nobody stands up against them. And when somebody does, UCLA goes after them, and it's well documented, and I've talked about on the show different examples of UCLA professors getting harangued, suspended, and ultimately leaving. So um, Joseph Hansen has decided he's leaving. He's got many years, he could still stay at the university, he could get a salary, he could do very little, he could be like Jeff, not interact with anybody, teach his classes, get a nice pay, but instead, he is retiring. Why? Because it's too painful. It's too painful for him to see what's becoming of his department, what's becoming of his university. It's too painful, given that he's a Jew, to see the hostility towards him and his fellow Jews, I guess, on campus. 
Um, it's too painful to see meritocracy, free debate, out the window. And he'd rather leave and fight from the sidelines. And indeed, that is what he is doing. Now, this is only going to get worse. There's no self-correcting mechanism here. There's no constituency that is going to say, but this is all wrong. This doesn't, the professors are not going to do it. Too many of them uh, uninterested. Too many of them think that the far left has the moral high ground, even if it's implicit, even if they don't agree with them. Too many of them are older. The younger people coming up are the more radicalized. There's nothing to fix this. There's no marketplace. I mean, the marketplace would be students. Students would stop going to these universities. But where else can they go? And we'll get to that in a minute. I mean, there's a sense in which the one mechanism to fix this is alumni. Stop giving contributions, stop giving donations for years and years now. I've been telling business groups, if you want to save America, if you want to help this country, the one thing you can do is stop giving money to your alma mater. But nobody listens. I know people who are very friendly towards objectivism, super wealthy, billionaires, who could do whatever they want with their money, give it to anybody who want, say whatever they want. Nobody can touch them in a sense. And yet, they will give to their alma mater. They will sit on boards at their alma mater. They'll bitch and complain about it constantly. Oh, the universities are so left. And they'll write another $5 million check. Partially because that way their kids can go to that alma mater, to their university. Why do they want them to if they're so damn left? Because of the prestige, the prestige of the university, the prestige of being on their board, the prestige of just getting along. The prestige because everybody else on the board is a big shot businessman like them. So you see this pattern of wealthy Americans, whether they're conservatives or whether they're just center right or whether they're libertarians, who continue to fund the universities, continue to write checks, and they think that they're writing it to this program or that program and somehow it's secluded or they're building a building. But everybody knows money is fungible. Everybody knows that if you write a check to a university that's not very, very clearly delineated towards something new, you're basically funding the status quo, funding the status quo getting worse, funding the move, the move. Towards even worse and worse and worse. I remember years ago, uh, the, the uh, Board of Regents of Dartmouth tried to rebel against the university, against its hiring, against its move towards the left, and they were ultimately crushed. In many ways, the existing university systems, particularly the big ones, particularly the public ones, but even you know, in some extent, the, the Ivy Leagues are worse than anybody, are doomed. There is no way out of this cycle. The only way out is for students to stop going. And for that, students have to have an alternative. And here, I think there is some hope. We saw the University of Austin last year. I think they just started offering classes, or they're starting in the fall. I saw another university uh, started in, in, um, uh, in Savannah, Georgia, where Jordan Peterson, I guess, is the chancellor or something like that, that is trying to be an alternative to the uh, existing universities. There are now online universities, online degrees, online classes. There's, of course, YouTube, where people are learning a lot of stuff. There are uh, these boot camps where you can learn programming, learn particular skills. and some of these boot camps, you don't actually pay tuition until you get a job, and then you pay a percent of what you earn. So slowly, we're seeing alternatives, but it's slow. In the meantime, the universities are breeding ground for worse and worse and worse graduate students, which means worse and worse and worse 
future professors, which means worse and worse and worse intellectuals who then influence everything about our culture. Because they're the people who are quoted on television, the people who write the books, the people who advise presidents, they're the people who influence what is going on. And there's no, there's no surprise that the right in the United States is rebelling. The right in the United States is rebelling against what they call the elites. What they mean by the elites, they mean these university professors and the people they influence, and the people they train, the people who take them seriously. There is a real rebellion against this nutty left. The rebellion is not in academia. It's outside of academia. It's about academia. It's about the influence academia has, and it's about the people who've been influenced by that academic, academic, these academic programs. I, as you know, I don't think it's a good uh, way in which to address them. I don't think the right knows what they're doing. I think the right ultimately is going to be as bad as the left, but this is what the rebellion is about. If you want to rebel against academia, then it makes complete sense in a, in a way to vote for Donald Trump, right? He's the opposite. Or at least presents himself as the opposite. There's more similarity to them than most people realize. So this is what they're rebelling against, and they're rebelling against, a, 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 you know, points of view about race and diversity and the nature of reality and the nature of sex and gender and all these things. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.